I've read that you tend to, uh, you've, you've been known to be quite shy and reserved at times. <laughs> <laughs> Characteristic. So how, how has that uh, in any way served as a challenge uh, in perhaps trying to pursue moral courage in certain aspects of business? Yes, I, it's, it's true that I'm, I'm shy and, and kind of retiring. And, <laughs> uh, and one of the sacrifices I've made over the last 15 years is uh, to have lost that anonymity which I enjoyed so much. It, it used to be a pleasure to walk down the beach and be by yourself instead of somebody coming up to you and, and asking for a job for their <laughs> or saying that their car's left wheel was making noise <laughs> and uh, with, with that comes over the years is some of the defense mechanism. Uh, and first you're very, uh, very receptive, but then when people call you at midnight and say their air conditioning doesn't work and, and you don't know what you're supposed to do, are you supposed to go with the screwdriver and try to fix it or refer him to a place? And eventually, uh, I guess a certain degree of frustration and a certain degree of reaction to that. Lets you to, leads you to be less shy and and maybe more provocative than than you have, and you take it out on new people. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Chekai, Provost, and I are a bit afraid now on the stage. <laughs> if we are provoking you, please tell us. <laughs> that said, my air conditioning at home is. <laughs> I, I will just, just don't call me. Because... <laughs> uh, with, with that, uh, are there any other students who would like to um, question but not provoke uh, our distinguished guest today? Mr. Tata, uh, please, please. Yeah, uh, good morning. My name is Bridget and I'm an MBA student. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Tata. What, in his personal opinion, are the current reforms that India needs to drive this growth? I mean, the GDP has been falling. So, what, in your personal opinion, as I from Tata, do you think the current uh, reforms are needed in India? Sorry, the current. Uh, what is the reforms uh, to improve growth? You know, the, no. The question is what what the current reforms what, are what the reform, yes. are doing. For the, uh, for the growth of India, or? Okay. You know, it, I think after almost a decade of, of considerable growth, eight, eight plus percentage, and a very uh, moderate inflation rate of over 4%, in 2008 9, India stumbled. Uh, it stumbled first because uh, for reasons of energy costs and, and food costs, inflation shot up, in fact, for a period of time to double-digit figures. And the central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, set itself up in a very draconian manner to curb that inflation. We had about 13 interest rate rises in one year, and it brought investment, it got held back, growth stumbled, and a series of measures uh, uh, deprived India of the credibility that it had in terms of investor confidence, both from outside and inside, people started to wonder whether it was the time to make new investment, establish new capacity, or, or hold off. So that's the, that's the backup, plus the scams and the court issues, all of which brought India down to 5 or sub-5% growth 
which to many has been like a recession. So in that context, uh, the measures that the more, most recent budget has done have been very moderate and, and perhaps while they're a sign of moving in the right direction, the question that one must ask is, is it enough and is it too late? My, my own feeling is that some of the confidence in, in the economy amongst Indians and perhaps amongst investors is restored. But a lot more needs to be done if India is to be moving back into the uh, visibility and, and, and the attraction that it had some years ago. And maybe just moderate moves are not going to be enough to undo the damage that has been done over the last few years. I think we will re-establish a 7% plus uh, growth rate in a couple of years driven by the fact that we've got pent up demand in the country. But it's not going to be uh, as attractive as it has been in the past. tremendous differences. Um, some of them had to be equalized, obviously, and some I think it was a learning exercise for us and, and we gained something from, uh, from that. I need to say a couple of things. Because in these acquisitions we are located 5,000 odd miles away from uh, from these companies and because it has not been our st style to send in a transition team the next day and change the management and replace them with Indian management. Whenever we've made an acquisition, one of the things we have done in, in a quiet way but quite extensively is satisfy ourselves that the DNA of the company and the human chemistry is something that's compatible to ours, both in terms of values, in terms of integrity, in terms of the manner in which the company is, is uh, run. And, uh, you know, if, if a company, for example, had a uh, an armament company as a subsidiary, I don't think we'd really be very keen to acquire that company. If the company was making landmines, I don't think we, somewhere in the, in the periphery, we would not necessarily want to be associated with that. So, uh, I think we make these inquiries and tests and try to determine whether we can coexist. And then we make the acquisition. And then we are confined to a few people who feel differently and we may need to make some changes, but they're then peripheral. And most of our acquisitions depend on the company, the acquired company itself, making their own destiny and us supporting them or, or, or guiding them. Good morning, sir. My name is Nitin, uh, and I'm a student at SMU. I was just wondering, uh, you went to Cornell for uh, an undergraduate degree in architecture and then mo moved on to Harvard for a degree in business management, um, right after which you took over uh, the Tata Group. I was just wondering, uh, if you were to list uh, three lessons that you learned in your, uh, through your college life, 
that you saw as a direct application later in life, be it academic or, the, or otherwise, what would they be? Uh, Mr. Tata, I think it's important to set the context. We are now going into our 11th week of the term. And <laughs> exams are coming, so a lot of us are wondering, is this all worthwhile? <laughs> You know, one, one thing I learned, which is quite often you learn things in a very casual, offhand way. Uh, I don't mean that you learn something from what's written on a bathroom wall or something, <laughs> but equally by accident. And so one of them was in my sophomore year in, in college. I'd always grown up, for some reason, with, with my father saying, if you do this, I'll do this. It was always a quid pro quo. So at some stage, one of my classmates said, why is it that everything you do has this quid pro quo? Why can't you just uh, ask or, or do something without a quid pro quo? And that was a relatively unrelated issue for later in life, but it made a big difference on me because I I had to go back and think that this was a very fundamental change in, in the way I did things. That's one. The other was at the Harvard Business School later, in, in that there was one, one course which left a very great mark on me and has helped me enormously in, in business, and that was uh, a statement that put yourself on the other side, in the shoes of the person on the other side, and look at the problem from his standpoint. And I cannot say how much that has helped me from time to time in discussions, in negotiations, in relationship building. Uh, and so I can give you two examples. The third uh, doesn't really come to mind. But I think that if I were to make a third, I would say that you've got to keep informing yourself that humility and, and public visibility are two things you have to cope with. You, in, in business, in many cases, you're in a fishbowl, and a decision that you make must end the test of public scrutiny, and only you can keep testing that yourself. The day you feel that something doesn't quite stand that test, my advice would be, don't do it. Even if you feel that you're losing out, don't do it. And if it does stand that test, have the guts to do it, if, if that's what you believe is the right thing. Good morning, Mr. Tata. My name is Sagar, and uh, I'm an SME student year, last year, about to graduate. Um, my question to you is related to what you just said, and um, it's one of your famous quotes uh, I have read. You said, um, I don't believe in making right decisions. I take a decision and make them right. Uh, and when I pondered over what you said, Somehow, I got a feeling that uh, while it is a very it is a very good quote and it inspires a lot of people, uh, I don't know how realistic it is in in the world that we live in. Isn't it? Uh, in business schools all around the world, we're all taught the meaning of flexible leadership, where you change your decisions once you have new information coming in. So, how how realistic is sticking to your guns and just? making any decision that you take right and follow it through. Thank you. You know, first of all, let's accept that not all decisions you have, that a human being makes is going, are going to be right. And you are going to make some mistakes and you are going to be wrong, either because of something you did or because the environment wasn't what you thought it was. Uh, so two or three things. Uh, 
I think you have to, on the one hand, balance tenacity to make it right and balance it from being stubborn to the extent that you endanger your company by just pursuing something because you did it and you want to make it right. As against uh, accepting that things have changed and calling it quits or saying that you were wrong, I mean, that takes a lot of guts to stand up and say you were wrong. But to say it, people will respect you for that if, if that happens. And in Tatas there have been several, several decisions that one could say were wrong or were not quite what one expected them to be. And you should analyze why that is so and if you if you feel that there is a need for a change or a shift, one should do it. And the organization will respect you for it. So I don't think there's one should take the stand that it's your decision, so you're going to make it right and then you're going to throw billions of dollars worth of money into trying to make it right because probably after a while it's not going to be worthwhile anyway. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I don't think it's possible to answer what you may see through life. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, answer questions and you think that I'm not being a good moderator and looking at your hands, feel free to uh, start queuing up the mics. That's, uh, that's fine as well. I notice in most events that I go to, that's what happens. Especially with Mr. Tata, I think the queue will extend to the swimming pool upstairs. I'm giving you to respond to the raised hand. Is that sure. That? I'm just here at your wish. <laughs> go ahead. Good morning, my name is Devika and I'm a final year student here at SMU. I want to know what makes you happy and what or where or whom do you draw your strength from? What makes you, what makes you happy and... What or where or whom do you draw your strength from? Well, that's a... <laughs> um, you know, some... That's, that's really a difficult question to answer there. I don't just say that a person like me is, after a while is pretty moody if you have uh, if you have a bad day you want to be alone and what makes you happy is to be alone and to have your space. <laughs> and at other times you like to be with, with someone who understands you. Uh, there are times when you can be with someone, the true test is if that person and you can, can be together and perhaps not even say a word to each other, but you're, you're there when you, you need the other person to speak to or to talk to. That's kind of the person you, you'd want to be with if you, if you had to. Uh, what makes you happy? I think that also depends on on uh, a moment. For me, uh, sometimes my happiest moments is to go home and be with my two dogs uh, because they they don't seek anything from you except your affection and your attention, and and that's all. And they give you everything for that. So it's, it's a lovely feeling. We humans have sometimes forgotten how to do that. Um, my name is Irina. I'm an MBA student here and I'm from Russia. And um, Russia and India have something in similar and unfortunately some of the things are not the good ones. So Russia and India are known to be countries that face the issue of bribery. My question is, um, do you think um, a big and influential company can do something other than adapt to the existing conditions in the country to help the country cope with the issue of bribery? 
I didn't quite get the question. Do you? Yeah, the question is that um, I guess, like in Russia, there is this bribery issue in India. So, um, as a big company, can you do anything um, to cope with this issue, to help the government, the society, to um, to go through this? I mean, to cope somehow with this. Um, in many cases, companies just adapt to this um, uh, unpleasant thing happening in the country, like bribery and giving bribes and everything. But as a big company, can you change it, it, something in the way government works? Okay. Very good question and very topical in today's global context. Uh, the I think if I just talk from our own experience, uh, you can stand up and and work against corruption and just say that you will not do it, and that's what we endeavor to do. And I say endeavor to do because, as far as the company is concerned, we do not do it. But whether I can talk for every single person who at some low level has partaken in getting something done for a gratification, I, I can't vouch for that. But as a company and as a policy, we will not bribe or, or buy our way to a, a solution. Can we do anything to help the government? I think that first question is, does the government want to be helped? Does it want to uh, wipe out corruption? And that requires a result, at, in my view, at the top to make that happen. In order for that to happen, the government has to be strong and be able to, to do something that's at the government level. So the answer to the second part of your question is probably there's nothing that a company can do other than to do it for themselves and operate that way. Do you lose out? Yes, you do lose out from time to time. But you can go, go to sleep at night saying, I didn't succumb. given the, the period of flux and uh, change, is that right? You know, I think if you want to fight corruption, you must be prepared to lose out in some cases and be victorious in others. Uh, there have been many known examples of where we have lost, lost out. And we have to be prepared to do that if, if that's what you want to do. I, I think in context to of Singapore. Uh, some years ago, we we uh, wanted to have a joint venture airline with Singapore Airlines. Uh, it would have been a great thing for India, uh, and uh, there is. Let, let me stop a minute and say, you know, very often this so-called corruption that we talk about has its genesis not in the government, 
with an invested interest group in the country, quite often in the private sector that wants to continue protection. Protection for themselves uh, in their business. And it gets put into government policy because those people are in influential sources of uh, interaction with the government. So, at that time, another airline was very keen to make sure that competition did not come. And through three governments in India, just made it impossible for us to enter. And so Singapore and SIA and, and we had no, no choice but to walk away from that opportunity. Uh, that's one very glaring example of, of, uh, of what we did and what we gave up, whereas I think there would have been other ways for us to to get what we wanted. There have been other examples where we have stood by our guns and not succumbed to direct or indirect issues of this nature. And where we have, where people in the government have been upright and, and have cleared our projects or supported us because that would be the right thing. And so you end up being visibly victorious. You fought something, stood your ground, and you won. And both things have happened. And there have been other companies uh, and other views that would say, why do you do this? Maybe the easier thing to do and the faster way to grow is to succumb. And that, I think, is leading to the rot that you see in the world around you more and more, and I think there's going to be a reaction to that at some point in time, uh, where people at the rank and file feel that they've been disadvantaged. So, I think you have, you have to decide what you want to what you want to be and what you want to project. And then you lead on on the basis of of what you believe in and what you have come to be known for. I I entered business, I followed uh, Mr. Jayavi Tata who had a very legendary position in the business world and the transition was somewhat sudden from him to me. And I was uh, faced with the dilemma of, uh, which is the normal reaction when you step into a big person's shoes or somebody who has big shoes, as the case may be, uh, that you wonder and think that you have to be a clone of that person to to lead an organization that he has built. And I think everyone has to realize that they cannot be, however legendary that person may be, they cannot morph themselves into that into that character. And that they have to end up being their own person. So the answer to your question is that you you have to be your own leader as you think the group or the enterprise has to be led on your principles, on, on your uh, projected behavior. But the important thing is that you set the tone, you set the standards. You can't expect others to have a standard if you don't maintain it yourself. You have to make the personal sacrifices because you cannot expect others to do it unless you set the example. So you have to lead by example and not by exception. Uh, then you have an organization which by and large responds to you and your leadership. Any compromise you make is a compromise that everyone will exploit.
<laughs> so if you get your question and then we'll, we'll head back to the students. Sure, sure. Hello, Mr. Tata. My name is Dr. Chiu. Um, China and Singapore uh, and India have different uh, methods of uh, development. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of both models. Can you make some comment on that? Second question is, what do you think is the future of uh, China and India economic and business cooperation? What do you think about China? So I think uh, the, the first question you were asking was uh, the difference between China and India, was it? Uh, method of, of governance and economic development. Okay. We'd like to make some comments on that. Second question is, um, what do you think is the future of China and India's economic and business development? How will things pan out? I think in terms of cooperation, is that right? Cooperation or whatever. In view of the 1960 border war, especially. Okay. Um, you know, unfortunately, and if one speaks honestly, our two countries are not as close as they should or could be. Uh, to a great extent, I think India has been in self-denial to what China has done or can be. For many years with China had high growth, India sort of thought it was a bubble that would, that would burst and was unrealistic. But China has done great things and has passed India by in many, many areas. And I really believe that India and China would would forge a very powerful economic uh, block if we were to find a way to work together and to cooperate much more than we that it hasn't been easy. Uh, I think India has a lot to gain from Chinese companies and the manner in which Chinese do business, uh, Chinese companies do business, because. The way, the way they have succeeded has been exemplary to us and it should be so to the government also because the Chinese government has played a very large and important role in, in the, the growth of the enterprise in, in China. There are many political issues that need to be resolved. There is the concern India has of the repeat of the 1962 uh, problem that they had, territorial problem that existed. And there are issues today of concern as to who is going to dominate the oceans around, around India and China. Each country has its own views on, on that. But I think perhaps one way is for business corporations to do more with Chinese companies. Uh, in our case, for example, the biggest investment we will make as a group with China is Jaguar and Land Rover building a joint venture plant in China that will export uh, products from that plant to markets all over the world. It's the first time that company, the Jaguar has ever gone to China or gone out of the UK. And it's going to be a remarkable uh, eye-opener in terms of how our Chinese partner will bring ingenuity and, and creativity to, to that job. And, and we should be open to it. So I think corporations should do more to talk to each other and, and make this ball. Um, so maybe you can have one from the top first, then one from the bottom. Morning, sir. My name is Suriti. I'm a final student at SMU. Um, my question is, if you can remember one such day, which was probably the most 
eventful day for you in your career with Tata Group? So one, the most eventful day. Yeah. Twenty four hours specific. <laughs> no, 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 just something that played out the most important event. Maybe. We have expanded it to events, sir. <laughs> This is getting very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> the exam from CMU and uh, SMU is uh, is getting to be exceedingly difficult. And I can't I can't think of what that would be. And I'm not ducking your question, but I really don't I, I really don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can share a significant. But. So this this event could count if you want. <laughs> I, I I think uh, we'll give him some time to think about it. If it, if it comes up, you the most significant day or event, sir, so that you can leave that to percolate. Okay. I, I, I'm just, my mind is trying to race through to uh, how to respond to that uh, and I guess uh, I could say that the day that Jayadi told me that I would be the chairman of the group was an eventful day. Is that the most eventful? I don't know. I can't, I can't uh, answer. Is, is the day that I stepped away? The most eventful day. <laughs> the freedom that I gained. In, in so is that the most eventful day? I, I, I don't know how to respond. Maybe one day when something emerges as a significant one, I can tell my, my leader here <laughs> to communicate that to you. Thank you, Pei And um, could we have some people, please? Good morning, sir. I'm a first year student from SMU and uh, I'm from Mumbai and I've always wanted to know what went through your head when you first heard the news about 2611 and basically how does someone in your position react to something like that at a professional and a personal level? Uh, 2611 was was something I hope doesn't happen again. Uh, it happened very suddenly. I'm talking of it from my from my experience. And I'm trying to keep my answer from rambling too much. It happened suddenly, and somebody calling me up and saying that there'd been some shooting at the Taj uh, Hotel, and. Uh, that turned into what it did with, for a long period of time, uh, not knowing what it was. The police were there very fast. We couldn't get the chief minister's attention fast enough to get the uh, commandos down there. So all of that being the case, all, all, that, all we could do at that time, it was the first three days of the gunfight was in the hands of the commandos. So all we could do was to mitigate this from outside the hotel for those three days. And where we really, really stepped in was to support our people who were in it, in the hotel or out of the hotel through those three days in terms of giving them support, infrastructure, uh, the guests, etc. The real heroes of those, of those three days were, I think, the staff of the Taj and not, not all of us because we couldn't do anything. It's that the staff was the one that protected the employees who served, who took the risks, who got injured or killed as such. What we did afterwards was that we, we considered that everybody who was there that day uh, was a hero. 
and uh, that we had to close the hotel for a period of time that we would consider everybody to be on the job through that time rather than lay people off. That those who died, their families would continue to get remuneration on behalf of the person who died as though they were alive until they reached retirement age. That we would try to send their children to school if they were minor children and pay for their education. And in some cases, uh, provide jobs for children who, who now didn't have a parent to, to deal with. We created a trust uh, which the public contributed very generously to help anybody that was disadvantaged. There were people outside the hotel, in the railway station, etc., who suffered. And uh, we have dispersed those funds. So we have tried to be as socially uh, conscious as we could beyond the, beyond the hotel. And it, it was a situation that the city had to face. The one thing I, I said in the first day was probably the true feeling of what we felt, that, that these terrorists had thought they could, they could destroy us. They may, have, they may have brought us to our knees, but they didn't destroy us and we rebuilt the, they found out that Bombay wasn't a soft target, that it rose to the occasion and it, it survived that. I hope it never happens again. that 
that you always think that what you did was the best thing uh, for the organization. And we should be truthful enough to say that there could be another way that might be better. So, in answer to the greatest challenge, perhaps the greatest challenge at this time is not to feel sensitive about the fact that you did this and this person is doing that, but to, to when you say that he should be his own man and he should have his space, then give him that space and give him that time and, and let him learn or enjoy it. Learn from his mistakes or enjoy the benefits of what he's done right. Thank you. I, I believe uh, Mr. Tata has answered your question. Or do you have any follow up? Uh, no, not entirely. Why not your time as the chair of the Tata Group? What was the biggest challenge then? Sorry, please. What about your time as the chairman of the Tata Group? What was your biggest challenge then? What was the challenge then? Uh, very quickly, the the challenge was that I think anybody feels is how do you gain the respect and the the support of an entire organization that for 50 years has been under another person, and the. The truth is that the challenge of that is that you you don't again go from compromise to compromise and trying to please everybody, but you do what every you take a little time to do what you believe is right. Not kind, but right and, and fair to all. I think that's all I could say. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah, Mr. Tata, my name is Lin Yi. Uh, I'm a PhD student in SMU, and I'm from China. So I have uh, two questions. So one is about philanthropy, and the other about uh, auto industry. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I think in the interest of time, because there are still a few other speakers, perhaps just one question. Okay, no problem. Thank so you, I sir. ask for the philanthropy question. So uh, philanthropy is in every day life in your for you and in Tata Group. So uh, what do you think about the biggest uh, problem in modern philanthropy? Uh, I would like to modern philanthropy. So the way people do philanthropy. The biggest problem in the world? Yeah, in modern philanthropy, the way people do in philanthropy. Okay, to our philanthropy in the group is grant giving. We don't undertake many projects ourselves. And our big, biggest problem in this, first of all, about 65% of all the dividends of Tata's flow back into our philanthropic trust. So they're the largest shareholders of the Tata group and the largest beneficiaries of, of the dividend flow. Uh, individual companies also spend money on on improving the conditions of the people around the plants where we serve education, medical, etc. The largest problem that we find in the grant giving area is finding NGOs or or organizations that will serve those communities and and operate themselves very professionally. So, where to give the money? And where to, and and the uh, complexities of monitoring how that money is being used is, in my view, the greatest problem that we have. Compared to North American corporations. What do we 
need to do to, or what do we do in terms of social responsibility? Yeah, our data group or just even other Indian corporations? We totally disperse about 4% of our net profit uh, collectively in terms of meeting our social responsibility. In the meeting that, uh, in fact, serving our social responsibility. Uh, it's it's something that that goes up and down based on on the need. For example, uh, whenever there's a calamity, an earthquake, or or a tsunami, the Tata Group will people will leave their jobs with our knowledge and go and work in a primitive area in, to help bring back, rebuild the village or whatever it may be. And it's a unit called the uh, Tata Relief Committee. It's formed and dispersed and disbanded after the calamity. Uh, and it's, it really, I have to say, it's not something that's forced by us, uh, but something that's totally voluntary by, by the people. It could be managers or otherwise. We also, at times of, of that nature, will uh, the entire workforce, 400,000 people, will donate a day's wages for that calamity. There's nothing to do with us. It may be in another part of India. And we will match that or double, match it twice over as a company. And uh, with it, we will undertake relief work. Um, to give you an example, and I'll stop there. Uh, when there was an earthquake in Gujarat, uh, we adopted eight villages at that time. And if you went to Gujarat those first few days, every possible company was there in one form or another. Every political party was there with flags. Uh, everybody providing blankets, clothes, etc. But a month after the earthquake, we were one of the few companies that were still there, and we rebuilt those eight villages. And there weren't many other companies that were even around by that time, after the TV cameras left. And, and so I think it's something I can't really describe other than to say that that has to come from within the DNA of the company. A presence. Uh, for example, uh, TCS. Uh, when there was the the uh, cyclone in in New Orleans, in, or or there have been problems in some of the cities where they operate. TCS employees on their own have undertaken relief work in that area. Uh, and have been remembered for it. In South Africa, where we have been, we have undertaken education or, or creating skills for Africans who, who have no jobs. I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that wherever we are, that that urge to help the communities around around us is there. And uh, wherever we can, we do it. And we, we would like to say that we could have a more humane presence in an area than another company might. Thank you. From, from gentlemen on top. Sir, yes. Good morning, Mr. Tata. My name is Joseph Kaki from Alpha Nomadia Consultants in Singapore. My question is related to the uh, phrase that you know, Professor Srivastava used in your opening remarks, referring to conscious capitalism. 
Now there is a perception that the Indian capitalism is not, I don't want to use the word unconscious, for a better word, unconscionable. The larger economy, Indian economy and the global economy, how conscionable is the Indian capitalism? Oh. Conscious or conscionable? In fact, there is a perception that this Indian capitalism is oligarch oligarchical. So, can we move on from unconscionable capitalism to compassionate capitalism? In that respect, where will we put Indian capitalism today as being an industrious leader of a industrious company and a group of companies? You have a better life for the Indian economy as well as the global economy. So in your, in your view, where we stand as a nation in terms of conscionable or compassionate capitalism? See, I don't know what makes the difference because compassionate capitalism, I don't know what that really means. Uh, presumably it means that you show compassion in, in some form or another. If you do it for purposes of public visibility, then I think you're not being compassionate. You, you actually are just serving your your own ego or serving your publicity-driven desires. So compassionate uh, capitalism has to be viewed not by you, but by the people that have benefited from, from you. And so I don't know how, how to respond to, you, to that particular question, because a very a uh, wealthy company can disperse huge amounts of high visibility uh, capital can just uh, well, can build temples all over the all over the country. Would that be uh, compassionate capitalism uh, to build uh, maybe uh, subsidized food stores? that people can, can shop in or eat, which would eventually not work, but initially would have a lot of visibility. I, I don't know how to... Perhaps I can uh, elaborate. When I mean compassionate capitalism, the benefits of modern technology and all the discoveries and technology we have should be available to the masses at large. What we see today, or maybe 20, 30 years before, there are islands of prosperity, the vast ocean of poverty. And the US, US today stands good, in spite of the tremendous technology growth we see around the world. Okay. I, I really believe that anything you want to do in India cannot be a non-India episode. It has to be showcased in small places. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we go back to the students. Ah, ladies first, I think. <laughs> or you could say it's unison. <laughs> ladies first, please. Good morning, Mr. Dada. My name is Kritika. Uh, I'm a business student from the National University of Singapore. Uh, my question is very short. It's, um, you have been an exemplary leader in the corporate world for a lot of people to emulate. And if you were to state three attributes that a leader of the 21st century must have, what would they be? Three attributes that? A leader in the 21st century must have. <laughs> short, short question, but very difficult answer. <laughs> I, I think uh, very quickly, uh, as I said earlier, the person should be his own person. They should not be doing things for, in terms of how they look, but what he believes is right. The person should be honest in what he is trying to achieve and be able to stand up to criticism for that if he believes it's right. And the third is everything he does should stand the test of public scrutiny. 
and he should abide by it. He should abide by what he believes in himself. Good morning, Mr. Tata. My name is Archit and I'm a second year student here at SMU. Um, from what I've read about you, Mr. Tata, you began your career on the shop floor of Tata's team, shoveling limestone into a furnace. How important were those early years where you were low in the hierarchy of the Tata group in your later success as a leader? You know, I've asked that question to myself many times. So, uh, <laughs> To be frank, I, those first seven, eight years, which didn't seem to go anywhere, were either either muscle building exercises or <laughs> exercises in pure frustration. Uh, I asked myself, was was that really planned, or was it um, a plan to break me and let me go back to the U.S. Uh, all I can say, if I look back on those days, they did a couple of very important things for me. They put me in, in a level where, where I could never have been otherwise. So I got to, you know, to use a word that's been used many times today, got to be more compassionate about that level of employee than I would be today. It led me to to be considerate about what workers had to move, what weights they had to lift, how easy a job was, and became conscious about that. In every other way, I don't think it served any purpose other than uh, to test me. Thank you. In the interest of time, I think this will have to be the last question. So, sir, if you could take your question, and if the rest you have something to add on, uh, please feel free to do so. Sir, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Tata. I'm Jagdeshwar. I'm a third year student at SMU. Uh, I'm a campanite just like you. I'm going from Mumbai. Uh, what I want to ask you is, uh, basically for the last 20 years, as you've been the chairman of Tata, Tata has shown tremendous growth. But what Tata has also been, uh, uh, what Tata has been phenomenal about is the way it takes care of its employees. And I saw this personally uh, in an internship I did with the Tata group. So how have you been able to balance uh, showing tremendous growth, but at, the, but at the same time taking care of employees to the extent that Tata goes out and takes care of employees? How, how do you show? Uh, balance between growth and considering employees as uh, your major, major stakeholders. See, I think in in terms of balancing growth, the growth that we want to have is quite often not not possible. We, you know, in Tata Steel we have a large expansion of our steel capacity in Orissa, which hasn't yet happened and hasn't happened for seven years. It's not something that an organization counts on, having that kind of delay. So. How do you, you know, in, in India we have, we have to operate in a somewhat unrealistic environment where things don't, you're not the master of everything that happens. And uh, so you have to balance that against a, an issue of uh, what you do if that growth doesn't take place, what do you do if you've got your resources tied up in in your plans for growth, how I don't know how I can speak of how you balance this against alternate uses of the, your funds. Thank you. 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 Thank you.